I've been asked to do this because I'm known for keeping several nerdy hobbies, uh, one of which is restoring old uh, mechanical watches, uh, which I think is uh, personally a boring topic. And um, instead, I want to talk a little bit about the history of timekeeping itself. Uh, because it's played a very important role in, in, in practically every major thought revolution in the history of science. Um, but in order to do that, I need to start at the very beginning, where uh, time wasn't so much a known quantity as it is today, but more of a sensation. So, let's begin. The most ancient cultures made advanced calendars like Stonehenge, which helped plan crop planting and harvesting. Time used to be simple, after all. Night and day. Hot and cold. Watch the moon. But what happens when you start to notice that the length of the day seems to vary? Ancient people took this problem seriously, and it was a Greek mathematician Hipparchus who proposed dividing the day into 24 hours to do the theoretical math. At the same time, the Greeks had invented a mechanical water clock, the very first mechanical device in history for the purpose of tracking time. Suddenly knowing the hour of the day permitted the Greeks to measure the angle of the sun in two different cities on the same hour and compare data. And in doing so, they not only reasoned the shape of the Earth, but the size of it as well. So with an increase in our ability to precisely measure time, we learned a brand new thing or two about the world we live in. Now this is a theme you'll see repeated throughout human history. Now the Babylonians were the accounting whizzes of the ancient world, and they loved the number 60 like no other, mostly because it was cleanly divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 10. They were the first to divide the Greek hour into the modern 60 minutes, and divide it again into the second. But most importantly, having a concept of minute let seafarers and explorers make the very first accurate maps for both land and sea. Minutes let people map space for the first time in a measurable and repeatable way. Here you have the very first appearance of the concept of the same coordinate system using your modern GPS, latitude and longitude. Latitude's easy. Look up in the night sky and measure the angle of the stars. Longitude, however, is a bit trickier. In order to measure longitude, you need to know the precise amount of time you spent wandering east or west. Getting precise longitude was the mother of all science problems for centuries. After all, ships crossing the Atlantic frequently perished from being lost at sea. It was such a threat that by the 1700s, the British Parliament offered cash rewards to be the first to create a precise clock that could be brought in a boat. Now, the very first geared clocks came from Islamic Spain during the Middle Ages. They became a huge hit throughout Europe because churches could now let people know when to come to service. However, they still weren't very good until a Dutchman named Christian Huygens created the pendulum, a swinging weight which regulates circular motion and increases reliability. When combined with an anchor escapement, you have the world's first ticking clock. Now you could peer further into the fleeting realm of time, getting down to the precise measurement of the second. So, would another magnitude of precision change our understanding of the world again? In fact, dramatically. To be able to see the world in mere seconds is now to measure motion itself. The story of classical physics is written in the language of movement. From Kepler to Newton to Euler and Huygens, people could study distant planets, falling fruit, and speeding projectiles with unerring accuracy. Huygens himself was obsessed with time, constantly redesigning his clocks as he continued to toil on solving the great problem of longitude. Like others, he took to the idea about observing the motion of Jupiter's moons as a possible way to reckon one's place on Earth. But in pouring through the numbers, he spotted an anomaly of measurements depending on which season they were recorded, and from there, Huygens made a dramatic discovery. Light from Jupiter itself undoubtedly traveled to Earth at a set speed, and Huygens calculated that this speed was about 10,000 times the distance that it took the Earth to orbit around the Sun. And so Huygens discovered the speed of light, but never actually solved the longitude problem. That would get solved later in 1730 by an Englishman named John Harrison, who made the world's first wind-up clock powered by a spring. He won the prize and got the money. But knowing a thing or two about the speed of light can tie the human mind into pretzels. For one thing, Light speed appeared to be constant no matter where and how it was timed, and this confused many people, including Albert Einstein. Why should light coming to you be constantly the same speed if, for instance, you're standing in front of a speeding train that has a lantern shining on it? Einstein is the most famous man in all of physics for arriving at an absurd notion to this conundrum and being proven right for it time and time again. The theory of relativity at first glance seems like an absolute apostasy. Light speed is universal because the faster you move in space, time around you slows down. Einstein took this further, reasoning that not only is time flexible based on your observed motion, but that your own mass increases the faster you go, while space itself decreases in size. And it gets weirder. He boiled down all these relationships to one very creepy equivalence formula, and I only use the word creepy because it takes something very small and multiplies it by a very large number, the speed of light squared, to tell you that there's an unimaginably large amount of energy. One gram of salt contains the same amount of energy to power Norway for two years. So was Einstein right? 
Relativity has always been backed by unassailable math and is at the heart of the modern electronics industry. But even though relativity is a cornerstone of modernity, the time dilation effect was never actually proven until last year. Why is this? Partially because our ability to measure time needed to catch up with Einstein. Whereas a ticking clock like the kinds I like to work with can divide a second into five beats, your modern quartz movement can do the same by 33,000, making it that much more accurate. And even that's not good enough. To be able to measure the warping of time and space itself, you need to have a clock that can make unimaginably tiny slices. This is a cesium atomic clock. It's what one might call the state of the art in timekeeping. It works by firing lasers at a cloud of cesium atoms and measuring how much microwave energy they release. It's extremely accurate. It's so accurate that it's able to measure inconsistencies in the rotation of the Earth and its orbit, which is why two of these were put into orbit around the Earth in 2004 to prove if time really slows down when an object moves faster. And at the conclusion of the experiment in 2010, Einstein's time dilation effect was experimentally proven using these clocks. Other new things were proven as well, such as frame dragging, which means that the physical space and time around a rotating object like Earth twirl around it like cake batter in a blender. Incidentally, atomic clocks are also a core technology in our GPS satellites, as well as a linchpin of modern finance. But the applications for precise timekeeping are constantly being challenged by our unending curiosity about the world we live in. Countless questions about the nature of time remained in the unsolved riddle of quantum physics for one, an area where cause and effect itself seemed to have a flexible nature. And as the saying goes, only time will tell if we ever devise the means to answer these questions. And this has been today's Nerd Alert.